So in this super brief third chunk, I just want to tie up those loose ends there of photophosphorylation specifically and hit very briefly on photosynthesis without oxygen. I know I ended the last chunk by briefly going over uh, photophosphorylation, but I did it with a single slide and I wanted to break it down a little bit more to make it clear. So this is the third chunk, chunk C of lecture 19, where we wrap up the light reactions. We've already talked about the chloroplast quite a bit in chunk A. Uh, chunk B was all about photosystems 2 and 1 and the light reactions that they catalyze. Here we're going to talk about ATP production, photophosphorylation specifically, and again spend one slide on photosynthesis that occurs without oxygen. So let's get back to this idea of making ATP with energy from light. Photophosphorylation, this process, is much like oxidative phosphorylation solely dependent upon a proton gradient. And they've demonstrated this, scientists have shown this by doing a pretty good experiment. What they did was they took chloroplasts and they soaked them in a solution at a pH of 4 overnight until we had an equilibration. So essentially everything about the chloroplast became a pH of 4, quite acidic, a lot of protons. Uh, the inside, the stroma, the thylakoid discs, everything. And then after that equilibration, they went ahead and took those chloroplasts and put them in a beaker at a pH of 8, a basic solution, proton depleted. So now we had a proton gradient. There were more protons within the chloroplast than outside. They also added to that reaction mix ADP and inorganic phosphate. And in no time at all, they began to monitor that ATP was being produced. Essentially, as protons followed their concentration gradient from inside the chloroplast and began migrating outside, ATP was produced. And this reaction will occur even in absolute darkness. So it doesn't require sunlight. Yes, sunlight is necessary to establish the proton gradient in the first place. It is energy from the sun that allows protons to be pumped to create a gradient. But once that gradient is established, those protons will flow all on their own and make ATP. We already saw that the oxidation of water not only harvested electrons for charging by photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, not only released molecular oxygen as a byproduct, but also left protons in the lumen. Also, as you might have seen in the diagrams, although I didn't specifically reference it yet, whenever electrons were transported between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 in that photosynthetic electron transport chain, protons were also pumped, much as they are in the electron transport chain of mitochondria. And finally, when we reduce NADP plus to NADPH, we needed protons for that reduction, and those protons came from the stroma. Much like we contribute to the proton gradient in the mitochondria when we reduce CoQ and water, uh, or oxygen, so too are we contributing to the gradient here when we reduce NADP plus. So here is the full story then in all of its glory. All of this comes together to create a proton gradient with the flow of protons driving towards the stroma. We have protons within the thylakoid disc that want to leave into the stroma of the chloroplast. Those protons were pumped into the thylakoid disc either through the electron transport chain between photosystem 2 and 1 or by photosystem 1 directly when our amounts of NADPH are high enough. Photosystem 1 will work independently to pump protons exclusively. The ATP that's generated when those protons flow through this ATP synthase-like enzyme is the ATP that we will need for the dark reactions, the ATP that will combine with NADPH in order to drive the carbon fixation process. Remember, we left NADPH in the stroma, we're leaving ATP in the stroma uh, here as well, and it's both of those energy sources that will be used for the dark reactions. And while it's true this enzyme is not called ATP synthase, and while it's true we really don't refer to this as electron transport chain formally, although the details and the protein names in photosynthesis differ from those that we learned in the mitochondria, all of the concepts and all of the principles that we've learned about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation before, all of those general ideas apply identically here as well. Photosynthesis without oxygen really refers to primitive photosynthetic prokaryotes. Prokaryotes other than cyanobacteria that can make energy for themselves but really don't use a photosynthesis uh, oxygen dependent process. 
Um, we call this anaerobic photosynthesis because it's photosynthesis that can occur in the absence of oxygen. And it's efficient for ATP production, but it really can't be used for uh, making sugars. So that's why we can't really refer to this as true photosynthesis because there's no carbon fixation, there's no dark reactions. So all of the energy created by this mechanism is here and now immediate energy. There's no way to store excess ATP the way that plants can store glucose. And so these photosynthetic bacteria can't really make energy for hard times they can only make energy in the here and now still though light energy is what's being used to drive the production of NAD of NADPH and ATP all that we've just discussed for photosystem 1 and 2 still applies it's just that we can't make glucose and also those energy molecules are only used anaerobically because uh, we can't have oxygen around in this process or oxygen isn't used and it's only used for anabolism as well because there's really nothing to digest. There's no sugar being created. These organisms often use hydrogen sulfate, H2S, as their source of electrons and protons. Uh, it's more easily oxidized than water. It's easier to strip those electrons off. And so again, if only one photosystem is working, you can oxidize this compound in a way that water can't be oxidized. Using water as a source from electrons was initially a small niche exploited by a handful of photosynthetic organisms that had efficient photosystem 2s and 1s communicating with each other through an electron transport chain. But that worked so well, that niche, that those cells that could do that quickly blew up here on the planet Earth and became the predominant photosynthetic species. Uh, so look at what had become of that niche now. Almost every photosynthetic organism creates and harvests sunlight energy in this way. So again, just wrapping up loose ends here, talking about how ATP can be made from this system in a process very, very similar to oxidative phosphorylation and ATP synthase in the mitochondria. Really didn't want to cap off the light reaction story with at least giving some um, needed attention to this offshoot of the light reactions. So that's it. We're fully poised to see what happens to carbon dioxide, NADPH, and ATP as we continue the story of photosynthesis and move into the dark reactions in lecture 20.